Boa tarde a todos. Obrigado ao Pedro, obrigado ao Fábio pelo convite. É muito bom estar de volta. Um, entre um português, um colombiano que fala espanhol e um ucraniano que escreve ou escrevia em russo, para que a conversa possa ser fluida, decidimos que, que a sessão seria em inglês. Uh, portanto, eu peço a, peço a todos, os, toda a gente que não se sinta confortável com o inglês, que tenha ali disponibilizado uh, o nosso excelente serviço de tradução simultânea nestes, nestes debates aqui na tenda e, portanto, uh, podem aproveitar e, e, e ter na língua original, que quiserem, em, inglês, em, em português ou em espanhol, como, é, como for o caso. Um, eles, uh, os nossos dois convidados, uh, e agora vou passar para inglês. <laughs> they, they, they will need no, no introduction, but uh, here it goes anyway. Uh, Juan Gabriel Vasquez, uh, 50, 51 years old. 51. 51 years old. He was born in Bogota, Colombia. He has published several novels uh, that, uh, that have been given different, different and distinguished uh, awards. Uh, the Translation of the World, uh, Songs for the Fire, some of the titles may be lost in translation with this. <laughs> uh, the Informers, Circuit History of Costaguana, The Sound of Things Falling, uh, Alpha Guara uh, Prize, English Prize Award, uh, Impact Dublin Literary Award, uh, Premier Gregor von Rezori, Città di Firenze, Reputations, with the Royal Spanish Academy Prize, uh, Premio da Casa da América Latina de Lisboa, and another book, uh, A Forma das Ruínas, uh, do Premio do Casino da Pova, Correntes Escritas na, na Pova de Verzim. He has published uh, two volumes of short stories, uh, in Spanish, Los Amantes de Todos los Santos, e uh, também o... Uh, as well as the, the Songs for the Fire, as well as two books of essays, uh, El, El Arte de la Distorsión, and Viajes con un Mapa en Blanco, and a short biography of Joseph Conrad, El Hombre de Ninguna Parte, The Man of Nowhere. Uh, yes, uh, his books have been uh, published in 30 languages. He has uh, for twice won the, the national uh, Prize for Journalism, uh, Simon Bolivar, for his uh, journalistic work. In Portugal, he has published uh, several of the novels I, I, I quoted, uh, A Tradução do Mundo, Os Informadores, uh, Forma das Ruínas, As Reputações, e O Barulho das Coisas ao Cair. Andrei Kurkov, he was born in St. Petersburg in 1961, so he's 63 years old. Uh, and has uh, lived in Kyiv since, uh, since his childhood. He studied foreign languages and worked as a newspaper editor with the novel Death and the Penguin, but also Grey Bees and Diary, Diary of an Invasion. He has achieved the status of uh, one of the most famous uh, contemporary Ukrainian uh, writers. His books have been published in 42 languages. This year, 2024, uh, he released The Silver Bone, the first in a new series of uh, detective novels titled The Kiev Mysteries. The second book, The Stolen Heart, will be published next year. He's in the process, as far as I know, of writing the third book, The Public Sona Cause. Uh, he has for long been a, a very respected commentator on TV, namely uh, on Ukraine and uh, in Ukraine on the, and as well on, uh, on global media. Uh, as I said before, he lives in, uh, in Kyiv. Um, and I'll start with you, Andrei. After the, after the 2022 uh, Russian invasion, uh, you became, uh, as they call it in UN, an inter internally displaced person, IDP. Uh, but uh, nevertheless, you, you kept on uh, talking and uh, writing and broadcasting about the, the war. This panel is about, uh, as a thematic line, uh, conflict. And you told me in an interview in Lisbon in October 2022 that for Ukrainians, freedom is much more valuable than stability of, or money. Uh, I ask you if two years after, if it's still the case, or if people 
being so exhausted by the war, are more and more anxious to get that stability. Well, nobody, uh, uh, good, good afternoon. Uh, nobody expects uh, stability to come and to settle in Ukraine because in Ukrainian history there were very uh, few years of stable life. Uh, but, uh, I mean, Ukraine is very different today from Ukraine uh, 2021, 2022 because we have about 7 million Ukrainian refugees abroad. And if you ask them about stability and freedom, probably they will give different answer. We have about between five and six million internally displaced persons, and half of population still lives where they lived. And uh, yes, uh, if in 2022, uh, the journalists were asking Ukrainians how many of them would be uh, prepared to sacrifice Ukrainian territories for peace with Russia. So there was 5% of Ukrainians who were happy to leave occupied territories with Russia. Today, after almost three years of the war, we have about 15 to 18% of people who are ready, but the majority is not ready. So for the majority of Ukrainians, freedom remains more important than stability. But do you think that the, the, the full-scale invasion by Russia has uh, somehow transformed your notion of conflict? Notion of your, your notion of conflict, what conflict means to you? Well, I mean, I, I don't use the word conflict, I use the word war. Because, I mean, conflict is something when you are quarreling with your neighbors. Yeah, I mean, yes, I mean, Russia is our neighbor. But this is not a quarrel when actually a neighbor comes and kills half of your family. It is invasion, yeah. So, I mean, if we talk about the war, uh, yeah, I mean, it is a very new kind of war. It's a war that you can follow live on YouTube. Uh, it, this war is very much like video games, because you see people killed uh, live from the drones. And, uh, and actually, Ukrainians are now watching Ukrainian drones uh, destroying Russian tanks, and Russians are watching on their YouTube channels and live streams Russian drones killing Ukrainian civilians and soldiers. So, it's, I think this, this war is the opening of the new generation of wars. And also, at the same time, people, because, I mean, because of this technology, uh, it is possible even with a smaller army to keep aggressor uh, well, not at bay, but actually, I mean, Russia is advancing, but advancing slowly because of the drones, because of the uh, motivation of Ukrainian soldiers. At the same time, 20 kilometers from the front line, a uh, small shop is working, and it will stop working only if it is destroyed by Russian bomb. And in Kiev, you cannot buy tickets to theater because all tickets are sold out uh, a month or two months in advance. So life didn't change that much in Kyiv? Uh, I mean, if you, if you come to Kyiv, you think, well, it's just normal life, yes. Except that people in Kyiv don't sleep at night already for more than two months. Every night we have sirens for 10 hours. So from 11 p.m. till 9, 10 a.m., uh, people are either in the corridor, away from the windows, they're listening to the explosions, or they go into the shelters or in the underground. And in the morning they go to work, they go to cafes, and in the evening they might go to theater. But I mean, it, the, the whole idea is that people are traumatized psychologically and it will be uh, felt by, uh, in, I mean, in the next 20 years. There is much more violence in the families because people get, get aggressive, radicalized. If you don't sleep, you, I mean, you can look okay if you feel enough, drink enough coffee in the morning, but you, you don't feel okay. <laughs> but still you are trying, I mean, people are stubborn. I mean, they want to have the same style of life and very many of them think that this is the way they resist the war. We'll go, we'll go further into that. Uh, Juan Gabriel, can we, can we get in conflict with our own country? Can we get conflict with our own country? There's nothing but conflict with our own country um, from where I stand. Uh, I think we live in, 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 in that kind of tension. 
when you come from a place such as mine, where we've had a, um, uh, a war that has been through several incarnations over the years, and that was more than 60 years long when we tried to end it um, eight years ago. There were these agreements, a negotiation first between the Colombian government and the FARC guerrilla movement. These, um, these guerrilla movements born in the 60s under the ideological umbrella of the Cuban Revolution. Um, one of them, the most powerful, the biggest, was the FARC. The government carried out a successful negotiation with that, um, with that guerrilla. But the president had promised, maybe you all know this story, the president had promised a referendum so that the Colombian people could go mm, to the polls and vote for the agreements or against the agreements. After a very successful campaign of lies and misinformation and distortions by the Colombian uh, right wing, the people became convinced that the agreements were to be rejected and the country ended up rejecting them by 50,000 votes out of 12 million. And that, right, that right wing was kind of sponsored by the former president, Alvaro Uribe. Yes, exactly, exactly. That the, the, the campaign against the agreements against, against yes, the agreement. uh, was led by former president Alvaro Uribe. So this is the definition of a country in conflict with itself. We have been suffering a war that has lasted for over 60 years, and when we were able to pass successfully a series of agreements, we were able to demobilize the largest guerrilla force in the world, the country wasn't able to understand the importance of the moment, and we ended up rejecting the, the agreements. They were renegotiated, and then they were passed, but the next president, Mr. Ivan Duque, um, received the government with a kind of ambiguous relationship to the agreements and he ended up not implementing them correctly and uh, um, w with the, the horrible consequence that many guerrilla members at the time who had signed the peace decided to take arms again. And so now we're back to the levels of violence uh, from before the agreements were signed the first year after the agreement, 2017, um, the number of victims of the war dropped nearly to zero. Now we're back to uh, the figures that we had before. It's a country in regression in that sense, and it's very regrettable. And, um, and the, the, the point is the, the, politi the political class um, is not uh, is not is not capable of, of overcoming their 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 disputes. Yes, exactly. Yeah. Well, it's not, it's not a question of uh, really the public opinion being against the, the agreement or being against the, the, the public peace. opinion was indoctrinated to 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 reject the agreements. Um, there was, as I say, 2016 was everybody can agree, I suppose. 2016 was a key year in the development of our contemporary um, consciousness, in a way. It was the year Donald Trump was elected, the year Brexit um, won, and the year the Colombian agreements were defeated in a referendum. The three things have one thing in common, lies. Lies and the, uh, the establishment of post-truth as a political phenomenon. We were all duped. We were all lied to, and we took decisions with those lies in mind. Um, so, uh, I mean, I do hold the political class of my country responsible for it, but I also hold the citizens who were credulous, who believed in the lies they were being told, things as absurd as, if we pass the agreements, our children will turn gay. This is something that the evangelical churches in Colombia actually said. Um, so, you know, we have a different relationship now with the truth of, or what we could call the truth. And what's it, uh, uh, and this part one, of the conflicts? This one for both of you. What's the what's the role of the writer 
what's the role of a writer, being a fiction writer or a non-fiction writer, in, um, in helping to overcome conflict or to deal with conflicts? Well, actually, writing is uh, provoking public discussion, especially if you write non-fiction. So when you provoke uh, civil society to discuss different topics, you make this civil society more active and more politicized. In Ukraine, actually, civil society is stronger than political elite. And uh, political elite is afraid of uh, civil society's protests. So, I mean, they are trying to uh, either to employ activists from civil society or to ask them to be on the uh, supervising board of ministry or something else. But, I mean, writers in the difficult times are becoming journalists and essays. So, I mean, most of the writers in Ukraine don't write fiction from 2022. You said, you said once that uh, you, you felt guilty yeah. of, of yeah, being I mean, it, writing fiction. Write, write, writing uh, uh, fiction is a pleasure. Uh, in the time of the war, it is a guilty pleasure. I mean, you, 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 I mean it's like, uh, ca can you drink, uh, uh, just not even drink, can you think about opening good whiskey in the house which is on fire? <laughs> no. <laughs> you, will, you are looking for a water. Uh, and, and, and generally, y y yes, uh, uh, I mean, r we, we, we will have, from the literary point of view, empty years of this war. Although poetry is written, but lots of non-fiction history books are written, but not novels. Juan Gabriel. This is very interesting. Um, perhaps the difference, uh, Andre, is that you are in, in a recent war, in a new war. We have been in this in this conflict for many years. So the, the position of the novelist is slightly different. Um, I found that uh, uh, one because, of the things- Because you have learned to, to cope, to, you, have, you have had to, to learn how to cope with the situation. Because I think one of the things you negotiate when you try to end such a long war, 60 years uh, of conflict, one of the things you negotiate is a version of the past. One of the things you're trying to, to, to come up with is a version of what has happened to us that we all agree with. And that version is told by historians, it's told by journalists, but it's also told by novelists. Because often novelists in countries such as mine um, come and uh, uh, contradict the official version of history. Um, so when you're negotiating uh, blame when you're negotiating uh, a, a, a certain kind of truth about who was responsible for what and what happened that led to some actions, um, lies will be told. The people in power will tell a lying version of the past because having control over the past means having political control over the present. And when history lies, when politicians lie, in countries such as mine, often novels, fiction, is the place where we try to tell the truth, where we try to contradict those lying versions or complement them or uh, suggest that they are uh, incomplete um, or that there are questions to be answered. But this is because it's a long war. I think if, if my country had been the victim of uh, a crime of aggression as Ukraine uh, or an invasion, I would think, I would agree that this is no, no moment to write novels, which take two years to write, um, by the way. Um, words have an immediate impact if you make them immediate. And so this is an interesting difference between two kinds of, of tragedies. Of tragedies. Uh, and, oh, what do you and, think, Andre? And Andre, uh, yeah, I, I agree. I mean, if, if people grew up with the war in their country, I mean, so the war becomes part of their life. Exactly. So, I mean, they, they have everyday news about weather, agriculture, war, yes. and sports, and football, yeah. They're all tragic. Yeah. I mean, even football. <laughs> and, you have, and, you have the, and you have to, to deal with, a, if I may ask, a, a conflict with yourself, because you, you, you were a writer writing in Russian for all your life, 
and then Russia invades your country. Is it uh, a conflict with the self? Uh, well, I mean, it, it, one can say this, but actually, I mean, the, the problem with the Russian language, which was in Ukraine provoked main, mainly by Russia itself, is a, a, an old story. Because yes, I mean, like uh, 10 years ago, 40% of Ukrainians were Russian speaking. And then actually in 2022, Russia came and uh, destroyed Mariupol, for example. Mariupol was Russian speaking. So I mean, uh, the dozens of thousands of civilians who spoke Russian were killed by a Russian army who came to defend Russian speakers. So I mean, in this situation, you cannot defend yourself and your mother tongue. I mean, uh, I still write fiction in Russian, non-fiction in Russian, English, and Ukrainian, but the bookshops will not now sell books in Russian because this is the language of the aggressor. And uh, I mean, there are still writers who write in Russian and poets who write in Russian. Uh, they are marginalized. Sometimes they are self-isolated. They exist. They will probably exist in the future, but uh, they will be ignored because, I mean, they are not considered part of mainstream Ukrainian culture. But, uh, and your, and your, your books have been forbidden in Russia since uh, 2004. 2014. 2004. 2004. First time, yes. And second time, from 2014, it was illegal to bring my books to Russia. And, uh, but any, uh, and what about in Ukraine? Since you were, since you were known as a writer, Uh, writing in Russian, don't you have uh, problems as well with, uh, uh, with mean, uh, Ukrainian uh, uh, authorities or Ukrainian Not with market? authorities, no, I have no problems with authorities, in fact, actually. And when I go uh, around the world talking about Ukraine, the embassies of Ukraine always uh, invite me or ask me if I need any help, etc. Usually I don't need any help. But uh, inside Ukraine, among my colleagues, some of my colleagues, of course, they, they say that you can be Ukrainian writer only if you write in Ukrainian. So, I mean, this statement makes writers who write in Crimean, Tatar, in Hungarian, in Gagauz, in Russian, uh, not part of the Ukrainian literature. But the, the, this uh, writing in Ukrainian is, uh, is, uh, is standing up against the, the, the invasion, standing up uh, or an affirmation of national identity. Uh, but at the same time, uh, being bilingual or Ukrainian speaking Russian was also part of the of that Ukrainian national identity. Well, Ukraine is a multicultural country with more than two dozens of uh, minorities. Some minorities are very large. I mean, there were 300,000 Crimean Tatars with their literature, with their culture, uh, 250,000 Hungarians who lived in Western Ukraine, and there are about 60 writers and poets who write in Hungarian in Ukraine. And uh, I don't know the number of Russian uh, language writers. Greek writers uh, in Ukraine, they lived in Mariupol you know, on the Azov Sea. I don't know what happened to them. So, I mean, in the end, I mean, Ukraine was a very tolerant place uh, from both political and cultural point of view. I mean, this tolerance is gone now because of the war, but I hope it will come back because uh, you, you cannot live in a country where your neighbor is of one ethnic origin and your neighbor on the right of the other one without respecting each other. Juan Gabriel, uh, let's go a bit into the books uh, or, or related to books. Uh, I, I found it rather interesting when you, when I read you said something like uh, in Garcia Marquez, 100 uh, years of, silent, of solitude, uh, what, stimulates you, what stimulates you the most is not the magic realism that is a kind of uh, characteristic of, the, of some, some Latin American literature, uh, because you find it rather boring. Uh, could you elaborate a bit on that? Yes, no, uh, th this, this wasn't the exact word. Um, but I do find that it has lost its novelty, that, that invention we call magical realism um, was a new lens Uh, very useful to narrate South American reality and Caribbean reality in the 60s. Um, it became very useful to other cultures. In other traditions, people from all over the world um, now confess that the discovery of magical realism in 100 Years of Solitude was the thing they needed to tell stories about their own countries, to uh, turn their own societies 
into literature because they have things in common uh, with the places Garcia Marquez transformed in his work. I'm talking about Moyan in China, um, Peter Carey in Australia, Salman Rushdie in India, Ben Okri in Nigeria, Patrick Chamoiseau in the French Antilles. These are all writers that have spoken about Garcia Marquez and 100 Years of Solitude as one of the most important things to have happened to them. But this was a long time ago. The instrument has become blunt and it's no longer able to discover new things. And this is what literature should do. This is what novels do. They, they try to discover new things. They try to, to um, go into places that haven't been explored before and come back with the news. So what I think is um, we need to read 100 Years of Solitude in a different way now. And the way I've found is um, concentrating on the historical side of the novel, which is very interesting. There's a moment in which uh, Garcia Marquez writes about an actual historical event that took place in Colombia in 1928, December of 1928, when a strike was called by the banana plantation workers, the workers of the United Fruit Company, American banana um, uh, exploitation company. And they were round up by the army, by the Colombian army, and shot. They were basically massacred in a square in a little town. Uh, this is what we call the, uh, the banana plantation massacre in 1928. Garcia Marquez uses this passage of actual Colombian history and he gives the actual name of the lieutenant who ordered the shooting. And he gives the actual number of the decree that called the workers um, criminals because they were on strike. And uh, on, this, on this chapter, uh, at this moment in the novel, the whole magical realism thing kind of has a, a forced landing in reality, and we start looking at actual historical events that have been transformed by the power of the, la of the language in, in, in the novel, the power of Garcia Marquez's imagination. So what happens in the end is that mm, he's able to reflect, Garcia Marquez, or the novel rather, is able to reflect about how history is written. We have never really known how many people died that day. Garcia Marquez invents a figure, 3,000 people. It is not true, but it is a metaphorical uh, number suggesting uh, that it was a hideous crime, a a, an enormous crime and that we have, uh, or rather, um, the official version of history uh, has never been clear uh, about it, even to the point of denying it in some, in some places. So the novel reflects on how history is written, who has the power to hide uh, historical facts and the role of the, of the novel in bringing them back to memory. All of that seems to me much more interesting than a woman so beautiful that flies, that she flies into the air or, or whatever. Um. Which, which means that even, even in fiction, history must, uh, should be told in all its um, cruelty, in all its... Um... Well, there is no must in fiction. There are no rules. But in this, in this novel, what Garcia Marquez is doing is um, reflecting with the use of the language of fiction about how reality, how history is written down. Um, but there are, of course, many different ways to do that, and, uh, and they're all legitimate. It's not a template, yeah. Andre, uh, your book, uh, The Silver Bone, the first volume of this uh, new crime series, uh, the, the Kiev Mysteries, uh, opens describing, as far as I understood, uh, chaotically violent and uh, worse ravaged Kiev. Uh, it, it was just a coincidence, or were you already uh, being influenced by the the sounds of war coming from the from the east? 
No, uh, in fact, actually, the war in Ukraine, I mean, this war which we have today, started in 2014 after annexation of Crimea and occupation half of half of, of Donbass. And in 2014, 2015, uh, we had very heavy battles in the east of the country. I went three times to the war zone in 2015 and 2016. I traveled along the front line to the border with Russia. Uh, and uh, I, I saw it with my own eyes. But of course, I mean, uh, after th these travels, I wrote Grey Bees, which is not uh, a novel about battles, but about people who remain to live in the, in the war zone, in the gray zone. Uh, but I, I mean, I, I was always interested in, in the history, especially in the history of 1918, 1921. Because, I mean, this officially, in the official version of Russian uh, school books, it is called uh, Civil War after the collapse of the Russian Empire, after October 1917 revolution. In fact, it was civil war inside Russia proper. It was war between the Red Army and the White Army, the Tsarist Army. In Ukraine, at that time, we had two wars with seven armies involved. Ukraine announced its independence in 1918. Hetman Skoropadsky was chosen as a head of state, head of the government, with the help of German garrison, which stayed for another year in Kiev and in Ukraine. Then we had another Ukrainian politician with his army, Simon Petlura, who was fighting against Ukrainian head of the state, trying to establish different independent Ukraine. And the biggest army of anarchists, in the world history was set up in Ukraine by Nestor Makhno. And this army was supporting Ukrainian independence. And then they changed side and they started fighting together with Bolsheviks against Ukraine. And then Bolsheviks destroyed them. And also we had Polish army. So, I mean, it was a chaos. It was uh, just a sea of violence. And, uh, uh, and in 2017, actually, I got a phone call from a lady who is my reader in Kyiv, and he said that she has a present for me. And she brought me a box of original documents of Bolshevik secret police from 1919 till 1927 from Kyiv and Kyiv's region. And this was, I mean, sort of the, the starting point for these novels, because first I wanted to write hi historical novels to, to show what life was like at that time. But then I thought it's better to expand readership and to make it a, a bit lighter. So I, I mean, it is a fusion of historical novel and historical crime novel. And it starts with a very violent scene where the main character is walking along the street with, with his father to, to a tailor. And the uh, father is killed and the main character, Samson, loses his ear, uh, which is cut off by saber by a Cossack. Is the, the detective. Yeah, he becomes then detective, yeah. Um, he, being a detective, he seeks for justice and order. And um, uh, as I read it in, in the British uh, Guardian newspaper, uh, it was written that uh, it was a way of exploring and illum illuminating a society under extreme stress. And uh, you also said, I think everybody's traumatized and almost everybody's trying to hide it. Well, I mean, people were trying to survive. Uh, every three months or every two weeks, the new army would enter Kiev with their new rules and with their black lists of people they want to find and to kill or to arrest. And so actually what people in Kiev were doing, they were removing names of the streets and numbers of the houses and lists of the inhabitants so that people who come from outside couldn't find a person. But generally, I mean, it, it's very similar to the situation of 2022. Because uh, the same level of violence uh, which was imposed on, on Kyiv and on Ukraine by Bolsheviks in 1918 was imposed on Ukraine in Bucha, in Gastomil, in the spring of 2022. And there was the same goal. I mean, the war in 1918 till 1921 was against Ukrainian independence. So, I mean, the Red Army fought to make Ukraine part of the Soviet Union, of new Soviet empire. And this is a, a slogan of Putin today. He says that Ukrainians don't exist, Ukraine doesn't exist, it should become a province of the Russian Empire again. 
So, I mean, this is why it's easy for me to, to write about this war of 1918-1921. At the same time, when I write about it, I keep today's war in my mind. And I understand that I cannot write fiction about today's war. I mean, I have a block. I am paralyzed if I think about fiction about today. And, uh, and bearing that in mind, how do you, how do you prospect the, the, the evolution of the war? And taking into account that the, we have another war that is now more proeminent in the, in the political and, uh, and mediatic uh, uh, attention, mainly in the West. I mean, there are many issues. Uh, first of all, Ukrainian war uh, became internal political issue in every country in Europe. So instead of conservatives fighting liberals in the parliament, you have fight between arm, uh, politicians who want to continue to support Ukraine and politicians who want to stop the support of Ukraine and to concentrate on something else. And we have already situations where in Slovakia, the political powers against help to Ukraine, actually pro-Russian, they won. So, I mean, the government of Slovakia is, is not helping Ukraine. They, 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 they say that they are waiting for the moment to re-establish re economical and political relationship with Russia. Hungary was all the time on Russian side. So, I mean, of course, I mean, Ukraine is less in the media now because of the uh, Gaza and Israel. But uh, think about this Hamas attack on the 7th of October last year. Why 7th of October? Why Anna Politkovskaya was killed on 7th of October 2006 in Moscow? Because it is birthday of Putin. And actually his plan was and remains to have as many wars as possible to make Ukrainian war small and unnoticeable and to make the West being incapable to, to look after all the conflicts and all the wars and to continue helping Ukraine. Uh, Juan Gabriel, um, with all this, we pay less and less attention to political process like the one in Colombia. Uh, how, how do you think that uh, things may evolve in, uh, in Colombia? It's, it's difficult to say and long to explain, but what I can say is that, that South American countries have been falling into the, the, the conversation about the, the Russian invasion as well. We have been, this is an issue that, that's, that's pertinent for us too. And we are a divided continent. Countries in South America have divided themselves into, into teams, those who support Ukraine because we come from a very long-standing tradition of condemning invasions and, um, uh, and the use of force by stronger countries um, against less strong countries. But there is a, a small family in South American politics of countries for whom it is, most, it is more important to reject NATO than to defend Ukraine. And so we have been uh, in our conversations, in, in, our, in our civic conversations as citizens, as um, politicians, as journalists, we have been talking about this too. Um, we have put together uh, a bunch of people led by Sergio Jaramillo, who was the chief negotiator of the Colombian agreements. We have put together a civilian movement of support for Ukraine called Aguanta Ucrania, resist Ukraine. It's, it's just citizens saying we condemn the crimes of aggression and the invasion of one country um, by another. And this has turned into a political lightning road. road. I mean, the societies in, in South America are divided over this um, because of old allegiances to old ideas of the Cold War. For some people, it is more dangerous to, to uh, allow the expansion of NATO than to allow uh, the Russian Federation to commit crimes against humanity every day. It's unconscionable. And this is something that has shaped, uh, that has uh, dominated our attention um, until the uh, Gaza war began. Um, and so 
in a sense, it's all connected. This is all in, in South America. This is all part of the persistence of certain ideas that are like zombie ideas from the Cold War um, that have divided countries um, in their support for the current wars all around the world. In, a, in an interview to a friend of mine, um, you said something like, if there is one talent that will divide humanity in the coming decades, is that of reading correctly. Why? Reading reality correctly, yes. Yes, I do believe that this is, this is what will, um, uh, will shape our political life uh, in, the, in the near future. The talent to identify lies and misinformations and distortions the talent in a world dominated by social media, where most people are getting their information from social media, the talent to separate truth from lies. This is what I mean when I, when I talk about the talent to read reality. Um, and uh, and uh, to tell the truth, I don't see it um, out there. We're not having this talent. We're falling prey to uh, the lies, misinformations, more than half of the citizens in the United States believe that Donald Trump won the election. Um, 2020. Yeah. Uh, big stretches of uh, the population in several Western countries believe that, um, that Ukraine was a Nazi regime. Um, so there are... The, the, we, as a society, we have invented these new tools that have turned into a very dangerous machine uh, for fabricating truth and fabricating reality. And it is our obligation as citizens. I think we, have, we need a new pact, a new social contract. Um, let Rousseau rest for a bit. We need a social contract in which we, as citizens, we be become fact-checkers of reality, responsible, um, uh, producers of information and fact checkers of the information that we received. This is the only way we will survive as societies. Andre, could you comment on this? Sorry? Could you? Oh, I, I agree. Uh, I, 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 I mean, uh, propaganda and uh, uh, disinformation uh, are probably as dangerous as missiles and nuclear weapons. Because, I mean, with a uh, with well produced uh, campaign of disinformation, I mean, you, you can occupy a country without use of the weapon. You can actually show who is the enemy and people will believe it. You can fake the proofs. So, I mean, it, it is very important also and uh, uh, it's, it's, it's a serious problem for, for Ukraine because Ukrainians are getting information from social media also. And social media, part of them, are manipulated by Russians. And of course, I mean, the Telegram channels which, uh, which give the so-called secret or unknown information. I mean, they are trusted more than the official sources. Yeah. So, let's give some space to the audience. Uh, as vossas perguntas, peço só, podem fazer as perguntas em, uh, em inglês, em espanhol, em português, como quiserem, peço só que se identifiquem. Deve haver aí o um microfone disponível, para além que está ali o microfone. Primeiro é que custa. Está aqui, tem senhor aqui à frente. Uh, it can be for both of you. Uh, when you talk about the information wars that we're living in, uh, apparently there's, a, there's a, an, an extra factor that I didn't get your mentioning it, which is about the willing of people to believe the lies they are told to. And I think that's a very typical uh, factor in social media area where algorithms tend to aggregate, to separate. They aggregate people who think alike instead of exposing people to different ideas. So how to deal with that in a world where people, more so than learning about the facts or learning a different version of the facts that they are being exposed to, they have this tendency of just, you know, putting a blind eye to those and uh, choosing exactly the information uh, they, they want conf people more and more. They, they don't want information. They want confirmation of what they their previous their preconceived ideas. So, how do you see that? 
Yeah, I, I, there's no answer to this. I mean, when I, when I was discussing this, this question um, a few minutes ago, I was talking about the other part of, the, uh, of society, those who are willing to um, make the effort of separating truth from lies. But of course, probably this section of society is even bigger. Those who do not want to separate fiction um, lies from the truth. Those who actively seek only the confirmation of their own prejudices and their own political um, convictions. And they will reject any kind of information that contradicts their bias. Um, there's nothing you can do with it. There's absolutely nothing you can do with that except regulate social media companies. Except realize that Elon Musk is probably the greatest danger <laughs> that we have right now in terms of corporations. He is a dangerous man. Um, and he's actively turning Twitter into a propaganda machine for the extreme right wing of the world. Um, uh, what do you do with that? It's, there's, there's, there's no answer. Uh, uh, Marcel Proust, the French writer, used to say, uh, there's no way to use reason to take from another man's brain an idea that wasn't, um, wasn't put in there uh, unreasonably. There is no way to use arguments to convince somebody of something when their idea has been uh, acquired with no argument, with no reason. There is just no way to fight that, uh, except from control of social media and a kind of renewed faith in the old media, in the newspapers and, and journalists. Journalists are wonderful people. They're courageous. Um, and they try to do the, their job right, um, and sometimes they make mistakes, as everybody does, but, uh, but they're responsible right now for the most accurate version of the world that we can find in many countries, in free countries. Um, so uh, I don't have an answer, I'm sad to say. Well, I can add only that uh, uh, we should promote self-education on every level. Only self-education can help people actually to start seeing the difference between lies and truth. Media literacy. Sorry? Media literacy. Yeah, media literacy. yeah, yeah, media literacy, yeah. Boa tarde. Posso falar em português? Eu sou francesa, mas vou falar em português porque o meu inglês não está assim. Ah, ao nível do... Queria ser clara no que eu vou dizer. Ah, eu acho que ler a realidade é missão impossível neste momento. Eu já desisti. Portanto, agora com a inteligência artificial então a chegar é mesmo para esquecer. O que eu acho é que o mais importante é talvez dizer que a base do conflito, ou o que alimenta o conflito é o medo. Estou-me uh, a lembrar disso por causa do Miyakoto, que falou há pouco ontem, e falou do medo, e acho que é mesmo a raiz do, do conflito, é o medo. E eu acho que o, os escritores têm um papel muito importante. É, com a ficção ou com os livros, tentar voltar à realidade, à, àquela verdadeira realidade, não é? Que é o nosso mundo, que nós sabemos como vivemos aqui... Pronto, tudo o que vivemos no dia a dia e conseguimos desmistificar um bocadinho esses medos todos que existem. Estou pensando numa coisa muito simples. Uh, a minha família está em França. Ou vem um noticiário a dizer que é uma tempestade enorme, que aquilo destruiu metade, sei lá, estou a exagerar, mas metade de uma aldeia. E depois eu estou no sítio... Não, não, mas não é verdade, não, não aconteceu nada disso. Mas, pronto, as redes sociais, todos os meios de comunicação, toda a propaganda que realmente é propaganda hoje em dia, a informação, está tudo virado para o medo. E o medo é que alimenta os conflitos. Se os... Não sei, é uma... É só um, não é uma pergunta, é talvez uma reflexão. 
se o papel da ficção ou de, dos livros, da literatura, não seria precisamente nesses momentos de guerra ou de conflitos, é, voltar um bocado à realidade pelo esse meio que pode parecer contraditório, é, usar a ficção para voltar à realidade. Pronto, é só uma sugestão. Em que língua contesto? Como queres? Em inglês, em inglês. Le respondo em, em espanhol. Sí. Um, yo creo que el, el, el papel o, o el posible rol de la ficción en tiempos de guerra o tiempos de conflicto es doble. Por un lado, uh, el que me parece a mí más evidente es el inmenso talento de la ficción para... Um, abrir un espacio de conocimiento del otro, para que el otro deje de ser una caricatura que es el enemigo eh, cuya desaparición yo deseo porque representa el mal absoluto. Eh, estoy hablando de, de, de conflictos como el de mi país. No, no sé si esto se aplique a, a una guerra como la de Ucrania. Mm. Eh, abrir un espacio donde podemos eh, entender al otro de manera más compleja, huir de las simplificaciones, de los maniqueísmos, de, de la caricatura del enemigo. Eh, eso sucede en las novelas. Pero también hay otro aspecto del impacto, o la importancia que puede tener la ficción en tiempos de guerra, y es que Uh, en una guerra, la primera, una de las primeras víctimas, incluso antes de que haya víctimas humanas, es el lenguaje. El lenguaje empieza a cambiar de significado. Um, en mi país, el gobierno, el Estado colombiano asesinó a seis mil jóvenes para hacerlos pasar por guerrilleros. Eh, muertos en combate. Eso no se llamó crímenes de Estado, se llamó falsos positivos. Es un eufemismo que transforma la realidad y la maquilla. Mm, la guerrilla, la guerrilla eh, secuestraba ciudadanos y a veces los asesinaba y eh, eh, y eso no se llamaba un crimen, ni se llamaba un homicidio, se llamaba retenciones con fines económicos para la guerrilla. Lo que quiero decir es que el lenguaje en un conflicto, y cuanto más largo el conflicto, más cierto es esto, el lenguaje eh, pierde su, su significado, el lenguaje pierde su valor como una moneda, como una moneda, una moneda que, que ya no se usa. Y una de las cosas que, puede hacer, eh, que pueden hacer los escritores es devolverle al lenguaje su valor, volver a nombrar las cosas eh, con, con claridad, volver a utilizar eh, nuestras palabras para nombrar la realidad de manera correcta y precisa. Y, eh, y esto no se puede menospreciar. Esto es, es un primer paso para, para oponer resistencia al... Eh, a la, a la manera como la guerra va deshaciendo nuestras relaciones humanas. André. Yeah, I'm, I'm thinking about your uh, mentioning fear as the reason for war. I mean, fear is omnipresent in the daily life of everyone. And actually, I mean, the war is a competition of fears. Because, I mean, Putin is afraid of death. He is old. He is afraid to be forgotten, so he wants to be remembered as the main Tsar who made Russia great again. Ukraine has fear of losing its independence. Ukrainians are afraid of losing their families, their properties, and many of them lost already. So, and actually, when I talk to people who remained to live in the war zone in 2015, uh, I mean, there were villages where only one or two persons remained, but they didn't want to go out even when the village was bombed because they had a choice between two fears. 
fear of uh, to stay at home and to be killed at home, destroyed together with his home, or fear to become a, a refugee, not knowing what will happen to you afterwards, who will help you and where will you end up. So, I mean, fear is everywhere and it's not necessarily the, the only reason for any uh, big or small geopolitical conflict or war. There are ambitions, I think, and, and ambitions are more dangerous than fears. Dois minutos para mais uma pergunta e uma resposta. Olha lá, não vamos acabar mais cedo. Não faz sentido. Is there hope? Well, I just want to uh, say thank you to, to Colombia because, I mean, we have hundreds of Colombian volunteers who came to Ukraine to defend Ukrainian territory at the very beginning of the full-scale invasion in 2022. Well, well. Yeah. <laughs> thank you. Thank you both. Obrigado a todos. Muchas gracias.